let's get back to the US markets and mostly let's get back to the major um, topic of our show or actually the first part of our show one week ago Milan hosted the asset management fair which was a major success for the Italian uh, city one of the main topics of this edition was the environmental social and corporate governance the ESG artificial intelligence and more specifically the impact of AI on the asset management industry is going to be the topic of the first part of our show tonight and I'm very happy to welcome my special guest this evening, Kunal Kapoor, CEO of Morningstar. Good evening and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Well, as I said just a few seconds ago, the ESG is a major headline of the uh, major uh, financial events all around the world. It was also during the Milan Asset Management Fair. How big is the sector in percentage and uh, how much of a potential do you see in it in the short future? Yep. Well, I'll start just by defining ESG, which it's really this notion of environmental, social and governance factors and how they are included in an investment process. And obviously we're living in a time where as people accumulate wealth or think about investing, they're also thinking about the impact um, that they can bring through their investment activities. And you really had the phenomenon of ESG really begin in the Nordic countries, where a lot of the sovereigns initially were very keen to do that and slowly spread over Europe and now I would say it's going full tilt around the world. I was even in China about a month ago and everybody was really keen to talk about pollution because it's such a big issue there and how the environmental piece of ESG can factor into how investors are investing. So I think we're just in the early stages of how this is developed. As you know, companies have not even standardized how they report this information. And so as regulators are looking um, at this issue, I think one of the things you're going to see is more standardiz standardization of information um, that investors can th then use. And talking about um, ESG investments, there is something very interesting regarding the United States because President Trump has withdrawn from the Paris Climate Change Agreement and he's actually denying uh, climate change and not only but according to him the organization initiatives are damaging the US economy. Do you believe this is somehow um, harm harming the industry in the United States and do you believe it's lagging behind Europe? Well my belief ultimately is that market demand is what is going to drive ESG and it's very much the case that ESG in the US is not at the state that it is, uh, no pun intended, uh, in Europe. But the pace at which it's growing is relatively significant and I think it's important here to also just spend a second on what exactly the intent of ESG is. So a lot of people used to first know about what was called SRI or socially responsible investing and the concept of socially responsible investing was naturally exclusionary. You were trying to leave out certain stocks from a portfolio so that was the goal. With ESG, it's more inclusion. It's more about how you think um, you know, the world may evolve and how you want to you know, participate and reflect that in your portfolio. So for instance, uh, Morningstar just rolled out a series of uh, carbon indexes. And our goal is not to say which companies are going to be more or less polluting. You would think that carbon indexes would do that. But really, our goal is even deeper, which is that if you as an investor believe the world is making a transition to a carbon neutral economy, what are the companies likely to thrive in that type of an economy? And how do you build a portfolio around that? So I think that's what's important. And you know, I'm a believer ultimately that you know, markets and investors drive demand uh, for certain things. And, and clearly in this instance, that's what's happening. And is it a trend um, regarding the millennials as investors or it's a trend for everyone? Well, I, I think you're on to something in that regard. Um, you know, there's historically, if you, if you look around the world, um, generally speaking, the money and wealth has been managed um, by the male head of the family. And around the world, we're seeing a massive transfer of wealth um, as people get older and often the wealth is transferring to women and more and more women are becoming responsible uh, 
uh, for managing their family's wealth. And then, as you said, it's being passed to the next generation as well. So there was a Morgan Stanley study uh, some time back that showed that women and um, younger investors certainly care about these topics a lot more. And so in that regard, your thesis, I think, is spot on. Um, and I think you're going to see that people are, are, are going to take a view of investing that has more to do with their values. Let's talk about artificial intelligence because it's a very interesting topic and very actual topic in the last years actually. So far 2018 was a terrible year for asset managers because 94% of asset classes had a negative yield which is not something uh, really a positive. Uh, how many active human asset managers have been replaced by the so-called robo-advisors in, in this area? Yeah, yeah. Well, the robo-advisor is sort of a bit of a misnomer because all robo-advice is, is automated advice. It's actually very basic portfolio building. And while the term robo-advice has gotten a lot of press, the concept of automated portfolio investing has been around for a long time. And that in and of itself is really not going to replace a human portfolio manager. What I think you're talking about, though, is do you get to a place where you have computers essentially doing the stock picking, the bond picking, the security exactly. picking. And again, I would just point to the fact that while we now use a fancy word called artificial intelligence, computers have been for a long time helping in that process. What you see now is their ability to process data and the level at which they're able to do it has continued to develop. So it's more sophisticated than ever before. And certainly we see a lot of active managers uh, putting more and more uh, investments into artificial intelligence and more broadly just into um, you know, computer technology because they believe it will give them an edge. And also, of course, from a cost perspective, uh, the argument's been made that you might need fewer analysts, but I'll just point out that even with AI, you need analysts um, to actually do the work on the back end and they, don't, they, they do not come cheaply either. So they're coexisting together very well. I, I think they're they coexisting can. and I think they will continue to. Certainly some firms may choose to go one way or the other. But when I look at some of the firms that I admire around the world, I think they're finding ways to make it coexist. And which is something very interesting is that in the last days, the major, actually the last months, the major headache of the central banks is exactly the inflation target that they cannot reach and they're a lot below their actual uh, targets. Do you believe that this major replace in the last period of um, people, of human beings by computers, by machines, have an impact on the inflation, actually, because they are, you know, it's very different yeah, in terms of... Yeah, it's of a good question. Um, and I can't say that I'm an expert on this topic, and so I, I largely quote what I've read elsewhere, and certainly, um, you know, I, th I, th I think if you look across the media, there's been a lot of uh, conjecture around the fact that one of the reasons uh, inflation has been kept under wraps is exactly uh, for that reason. The other thing that's often cited is that wage inflation up to this point has not been a factor. And certainly you're starting to see that become a little bit more as um, you know, workforces are pressured because uh, unemployment rates are so low in some parts of the world. Yes, they, they are, yeah. um, fortunately. Um, th there is something very interesting for me because the financial industry has increasingly been hiring people from different fields uh, like uh, scientists, physicists, experts of logic. So in this, uh, in this area where we already have so many machines doing the best job so far, um, which is the, the, best, um, the best qualities that uh, are going to describe the future? asset manager in your yeah, opinion? Yeah, I don't think it's actually that different from the past. Um, you know, certainly it's not an uncommon model. It has not been an uncommon model for people to hire from industries outside the ones that you would think. You know, for a long time I used to cover asset managers who would hire doctors to become their healthcare analysts. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that people have these career changes. But you're right in that more and more people are starting to do that. But the reality is regardless of how asset managers do their work and the strategies that they package, the key comes down to how investors do, right? And if you look at Morningstar data, one of the things that we've advocated for a long time and pointed out to is that investors do quite poorly as a group because they tend to buy high and sell low. Everyone loves Warren Buffett, but no one follows his advice. They do the opposite. And, and the data suggests that behaviorally we're wired 
uh, incorrectly from the perspective of being good investors. And so the challenge and I think the opportunity for everyone in our industry is to really focus on investor behavior. Because you can go hire the best people and do the best things, but if investors don't have the outcomes that we're all hoping for, we've all failed. And so at least from the Morningstar angle, we're investing very heavily in behavioral, behavioral research because we think you know, there's a pretty big opportunity there in terms of trying to help investors. And I think as an industry, you're seeing more of a transition to where people are building portfolios based on the goals of investors. And I think the portfolio-based approach has quite a lot of merit because it really kind of comes down to the notion of delivering kind of an experience and an outcome for the investor versus just trying to sell them something because it's done well for one year or three years. Right, let's talk about regulations since we are in Europe, we are broadcasting from Milan. I would like to talk about European regulation, which is a major headache for the US tech giants, as we could hear in the last days. But not only, it's been so also for the asset management industry, or at least the one in Europe. I'm talking about markets in financial instruments directive, which became active more or roughly 18 months ago. Yeah. And so, um, what was the impact overall of the directive? And let me point out that the directive forces asset manager, asset managers to specify and list all the fees they are charging customers with. Do you believe yeah. it had a positive impact or rather not? Well, time will tell, but generally speaking, I believe in transparency. And transparency is a good thing, right? And I, I think certainly, you know, when you look at regulators, one can argue pros and cons of both sides of it. But usually where you see regulation come into play is where there's a void or a lack of transparency or there's been an incident where someone has been harmed. And so I always say to people who have a negative reaction to regulations is the best way to avoid them is to self-regulate. And I would say that the asset management industry in aggregate has not always self-regulated. Um, there are many instances of uh, investors being sold products that don't make sense for them, of being charged fees that one could argue are very high, or being charged fees that they don't actually understand what the fees are and how they're listed. So, of course, regulations bring a burden, but often there's a reason as to why they come about. And I think ultimately, if they're there to help the investor, that's not a bad thing. Um, I, I would say in general, some of the things that are coming to play uh, in Europe in particular, technology would have made them come to life anyway. So I, I think to the extent that the regulator is forcing transparency and accountability, it's maybe speeding up the process that technology was anyway going to bring. Well, in, in, in this case, since they are in, in a difficulty, we saw that many of them couldn't implement immediately uh, the rules and the direct directive. Uh, do you foresee more m and more consolidation in the sector yeah, in I, Europe or also in the US? I mean, you're certainly seeing that most recently, you know, with Invesco purchasing Oppenheimer, which is a very significant uh, acquisition from a size perspective. Um, you've certainly seen them kind of continue. And I anticipate that in this industry, as in other industries, scale has advantages. And so there's two ways you can get scale. One is through acquisition. The other is by organically doing it. And um, the reality is I think if most firms are patient and they have a great value proposition for investors, they will probably get scale over time anyway, but obviously sometimes people are in a hurry and consolidation is one way of getting there sooner. But you also expect this in, uh, in the US, not yeah. only as a trend in Europe? It's a global trend. It's a global for trend. For sure. Maybe less so in Asia, but definitely in Europe and the United States. Well, let's move to the markets right now because in the last period there is a wave of IPO. Actually, the Wall Street IPO season is literally heating up. We had Levi's, which is, by the way, doing pretty well. So far, trading $22.95 per share. Lyft as well, doing pretty well. It just went public a few weeks ago. Right now, up by 1.90%, $61.26 per share. We are expecting also pink interest, Uber, of course, we are expecting an answer from Uber. Do you believe that these, those um, tech unicorns are investment worthy? So I always think it's important to separate the underlying firm and the economics of the firm from whether they're actually good investments or not. And I'm certainly no expert on some of the forthcoming IPOs. In many cases, they still have to file paperwork. 
But yes. I think what's notable is that many of the firms coming public have raised record amounts of capital during their private uh, time, and they're coming public at valuations that are quite significant and much later in their life cycle than you know a previous generation of companies would have come. So historically, IPOs have not been great for investors, and you know, kind of given the late cycle IPOs that you're seeing now, the amount of money they've raised and the potentially lower returns they could deliver given their high evaluations, I would suggest that investors, at least in the short run, should be cautious um, because there are obviously smart people who are also selling on the other end and they probably know a lot more about those companies um, at this stage than the average investor. Well, very, very interesting. So you better listen uh, his, follow his advice. I have a last question. Sure. We are globally in a pretty complicated situation. There is a geopolitical crisis all around the world and most likely a second a trade war for the United States, but this time with Europe. So in, in these times of uncertainty, which are the asset classes that are going to outperform in your opinion? Yeah. So one of the interesting things is that, you know, when, when there is uncertainty, you would expect the markets to be more volatile, especially exactly. to the downside. And you're not seeing that today. Um, so it's kind of an interesting situation because my answer to you would have been if, in fact, you were seeing things uh, more to the downside is that, um, as an investor, you should love uncertainty and volatility to the downside because if you're truly investing for the long run, you make your money when you feel worst about investing um, and buying low. And so I don't, I don't have a view as to what markets will do in the short run, but as a student of the markets, uh, we are late in a cycle um, around the world. Asset classes have done pretty well over the past decade. And so while I can't prognosticate up or down, I think the most important thing if you're an investor today is to calibrate your expectations for future returns because I believe they will be lower than the returns of the past decade. Obviously, there may be pockets here or there that uh, maybe uh, will do a little bit better, but in aggregate, it's hard to see the returns we've gotten um, over the past decade you know, matched in, over, over the forthcoming decade. And the other thing that I would just caution is Especially in Europe, we continue to be in a low, return low rate environment. And when rates are low, sometimes uh, people feel forced to take on more risk uh, in search of better returns. And I would just say to be cautious in that regard because you never want to chase a return. Uh, and you want to be very thoughtful, particularly if you're a saver, uh, not to move uh, money that you have in fixed income assets to riskier assets if you're going to need that money uh, sooner than later. Um, so it's just good to be thoughtful about that um, as you think about your portfolio. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Kunal yeah. Kapoor, CEO Morningstar. Thank you for joining us.